Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, April 17th, 2014. This is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week I think you might find that uh, I truly mean it. Uh, I've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Makers of Mountain Dew do not compensate me for this endorsement, but hey, PepsiCo, you out there. I'll give you an endorsement. I'll even wear your uh, your T-shirt. Wait a minute. I already do wear your T-shirt. How's that? Monster, if you're out there, it's been a while since we shorted you. I'd be happy to um, take you on as a sponsor, too. All right. There's a disclaimer screen. Let me just sum it up for you. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. This is a part of the show where I asked for you to throw me a bone. If you read my book and like my book, if you didn't, I'm not sure why you're here. But <laughs> assuming you did those things, uh, throw me a bone. Put me up a review on Amazon. Sometimes we have more people here than there are reviews, so somebody's holding out on me. All right, what are we going to talk about? Well, I don't want to spend too much time. I'd rather just show you, but uh, I do want to talk a little bit about bull market brains versus choppy market brains. And that's going to make a lot of sense in a minute. And I want to recap what I said last week about shorts. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I do want to uh, revisit it just because I'm getting some questions. I want to talk about making the transition smoothly, and that's a question mark, between uh, a possible bearish trend uh, um, developing or even a choppy trend developing. And, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist looking at the market to say, well, where are the peas? Well, where are the peas four months ago? And you could see that the market hasn't made a whole lot of progress. So even if you're not bearish, and by the way, I would encourage you not to label yourself bullish or bearish, but even if you're not bearish, you certainly should look at the fact that the market hasn't made much forward progress in a while. And we're going to get into that when we get to the charts. So we'll talk a little bit about relative strength and what happens when relative strength ends and some of the anomalies of that. I want to continue on the conversation that we had um, not too long ago. Let's talk a little bit about brains in a bull market. If the market looks like the arrow I have drawn here, I'll get comments like, bravo, and that's um, that's a quote. <laughs> Are you so right, Dave? Just follow the trend. This is great, exclamation point. I get it now. I finally figured it all out. And I'm the king of the world. Well, I don't actually get anybody that sends me I'm the king of the world, but that's the feeling that's out there. Kind of like uh, DiCaprio on the front of the Titanic with his arms stretched back, leaning into the wind. I'm the king of the world. And that's how you feel when you're in a bull market and you are a trend follower. Unfortunately, when the trend ends... It's more like, this sucks, or sometimes, unfortunately, you suck. <laughs> I don't get it. Five out of six of the last trades have failed. That's it. I quit. Unfortunately, that sixth trade sometimes turns out to, the big winner, to be the big winner. Not all the time. Sometimes you might get six out of six that fail, and that's just the nature of the beast. But usually, it's enough action to make people want to quit. And what's worse is they go on and do something stupid like chase rainbows or even worse, end up with another methodology or doing something really stupid like selling options. And selling options is a great way to have a very brief but brilliant career. I, I picked up a book years ago. It was like one of those, it was like 25 cents at a, um, like a salvage place. And I forget the name of it. I, I've since tossed it out. But it was about some woman, and um, it was named just that. My brief but brilliant career on Wall Street, and she talked about how she sold options and had made the best year and had the most amazing performance until she blew up. And I think that was in 1987. So um, this is a bad idea. So don't please don't go out there and do that. Or, you know what, experience is the best teacher. Go out there and do that, and then report back to me, and you'll see. Um, and then the, the the rainbow chasing begins, and then you'll find people doing something stupid like counting waves. And um, if you want to wave 
as your money goes bye bye, then by all means knock yourself out. And then other things like I'm giving oscillator trading a try, thinking that you want to try to sell this overbought and buy this oversold which in general is a really bad idea, as I often preach, because that overbought often becomes even more overbought, and that oversold often becomes even more oversold. So when the trend ends, things begin to change. Hey, Fred, we'll get to that in one second. So shifting gears a tiny bit with relative strength, when that trend does begin to turn, or if you want to be kind of uh, cute about it, when the trend does begin to bend, you're faced with a dilemma. Do you chase relative strength or not? Relative strength means let's look at the strongest of the strong stocks. And the theory is there's always a bull market somewhere. Now, that's one of the myths of Wall Street that I actually busted in layman's by showing that Virtually all stocks were down hard in a bear market like 2008. So there really is, there's relative performance, but you certainly don't want to be in any stocks on the long side when that happens. And I'm going to flesh that out in just one minute. Now, the relative strength I'm talking about now is those areas that are still strong relative to other areas. And these areas are actually still in bona fide uptrends. They're mostly defensive issues right now, and we're going to look at them when we get to the market. But right now, they're utilities, foods, um, what else, tobacco, and energies. And those are all considered defensive issues. And they're all doing fairly well, and they're all near new highs, and they're all in decent trends. The only problem is that a couple things can happen. If the market... Let's say the market does begin to roll over in earnest. Sometimes the bigger they are, sometimes these last of the Mohicans, the bigger they are, the harder they could fall. So that's one of the dilemmas of trading high or S. Now, last week we talked about, uh, or I talked about Mike Moody, who uh, formerly of uh, Dorsey and Wright, was talking about baby poop. And baby poop is like when I asked him, I said, hey, Let's say you're following relative strength and relative strength ends. Well, it usually ends badly, okay? Momentum ends badly, usually. It's like, how do you solve for the drawdowns? And then he said, well, it's like having a baby. If you're going to have a baby, you're going to end up with a lot of baby poop. You just have to deal with it. It comes with the territory. So the point is that if you are chasing these high relative strength stocks now that are up here at these very high levels, they could be priced for perfection, and if the market begins to tank, they could become a source of funds, meaning that whoever was in these from a long, long time ago might be thinking, okay, now the market's beginning to look a little questionable. Maybe I should start taking profits in these issues and then set up some cash. Or maybe sometimes what will happen is the market drops significantly. They'll take money out of these, and then they'll bottom fish in these stocks. Not that I suggest you do that, but I'm just telling you what does happen internally with the market, okay? So when you're trading high relative strength, again, the baby poop comes to the territory, and that baby poop is dealing with the sinking ship syndrome, meaning that that tide's going to drop. If that overall tide drops, if the overall market drops, the old Wall Street adage is often true, that falling tide will sink all ships. Now, relative performance, meaning that this stock is doing better than the S&P, this stock or this sector is doing better than all other sectors or most other sectors, is it's great when it's absolute, okay? So by that I mean if the sector right now, energies, utilities, REITs to some extent, and a couple other areas, mostly defensive in nature, are doing pretty good, and they're actually making new highs, okay? So that means that if you're long some of these, and that's adding value to your account. So it's great when it's absolute. But you've got to remember that you can't live off relative performance. Now, relative performance means that, let's say it's going down, but the market's going down like this, okay? Well, you're losing money net-net, but you're not losing as much as the market, okay? 
So you only lose 12%, okay? And let's say the market goes down 20%. Well, you beat the market by 8%, okay? But you can't eat that 8%. That does not do you any good. So relative strength is great when it becomes absolute performance, but not so great when it becomes relative strength, okay? Relative performance. Now, what do you do now when it appears, at least for now, to be the only game in town? Well, I think, I think we're forced to play the hand that's dealt. I think we need to look at these energies. I think we need to look at these foods. And I think we need to look at these utilities in here, and maybe tobacco, too, and think whether or not we're going to play these stocks. But I think your hand might be forced somewhat, okay? Just know going in that if the market really does crack, these stocks are going to get hard, hit hard, too. The other problem, and let me just show you this real quick. This is kind of the back to the baby poop thing, okay? Let's say right now the market looks kind of like this, okay? And let's say you've got some relative strength stocks that look like this. Let me just redo this. Let's say you've got some relative strength stocks that looks like this. And the market kind of looks like this, and you got a big question mark out here, okay? One thing I have found is if the market gets its act together and just starts to take it off, then these issues also become a source of funds. What happens is these issues begin to sell off instead of going up with the overall market so they could raise capital and buy something else. So it can really often be darned if you do and darned if you don't once the market looks like that. If the market looks like this, then it's the most wonderful thing and wonderful town to trade that relative strength. Okay. So again, what do you do? Well, it's the same old mantra that I have all the time. As usual, you want to take things on a setup-by-setup setup basis, okay? And by that, I mean, make sure you really, really like a setup. If you really, really like a setup, whether it's a long or short or whatever, then by all means, take it, okay? If it doesn't just knock your socks off, then you want to think twice about taking the trade, and you really want to reconsider whether or not you want to take that trade, okay? I guess just the same thing twice, but I do want to make an emphasis on this, okay? So maybe I'll say it again. So just make sure you really, really like the setup. And make sure you think that setup has short-term and longer-term potential. Now, one thing I wanted to talk about today, there's just not going to be enough time, but um, let me just go over it real quick. Somebody sent me uh, nine losing trades that they were in, and eight out of nine of those trades. Now, this is perfect hindsight, okay? But I guarantee you, if you were just showing me these, these charts today, I could show you why you shouldn't get, like, why you shouldn't get in them for tomorrow without hindsight. It was that blatant, okay? And in a lot of cases, you had a stock that was down here and setting up and looking really good, nice little pullback, nice little bow tie, whatever, but you just had a mountain of overhead supply right above the market. In another case, or several cases, you had a stock that looked like, that looked like this and then like this and then set up as a pullback. Well, you want to see a stock in an accelerated trend looks like this and then it looks like that, okay? If you have time, then go in and watch on my website. Go in and watch this free video right here on stock selection. Now, what I'm saying is there's a lot more. There's a lot more that was covered in, in, the, in the full video on it. But if you look at this one right here, Introduction to Stock Selection, and watch a couple of these free webinars that I put out here, some sample webinars, because in some of these I did talk a lot about stock selection, okay? And then if time allows and you have a lot of time, get the, get the, um, get the downloads for the whole thing, the all 14 hours. But in several cases, there were overhead supply. In several cases, the trade was decelerating, was this and not this, okay? And then a few other cases, the stocks were electrocardiograms, and then they kind of cleaned their act up a little bit and set up. And the question is, I probably need to 
probably need to emphasize that a little bit more. Let's see if we can do this. The stocks look like this, okay? And then you had a setup that looks like this. And this looks okay, but you really have to ask yourself, is this stock all of a sudden after five years of just trading all over the place going to change its personality overnight? Okay? And that's another case where you have to really think about whether or not you want to take the trade. So and there were a few other very simple things. So the point I'm trying to make is stock selection is key. And that's the thing that I've really been harping on all year is the importance of stock selection. And make sure you really, really like those setups. And my whole point is, and, and I don't want to soft pimp things too much or soft sell, but if you just avoid one losing trade, it makes it worth your while to go through the time and expense and study proper stock selection. And proper stock selection can keep you out of a lot of trouble. Not all trouble because none of us have a crystal ball. But if you could get out of eight out of nine losing trades by not even getting into them to begin with, then you're going to be well on your way. So I can't harp this enough. Make sure you really, really like a setup, okay? Um, make sure you're not reading into it, okay, and hoping for something to happen. And that's hard. Sometimes you want something to happen, so you're trying to make something happen by picking this mediocre stock. And go in, and I, I do this exercise all the time, and, and I, I ask myself, especially recently I went back and looked at 10 years' archives of what I've done, publicly at least, and um, in a lot of cases I'm like, what was I thinking, okay? And I think you'll find the same thing when you go in and do that when I was auditing uh, the trading service, okay? Dave, quickly, would you just have can't live off relative performance? Okay, Jonathan, if – let me get rid of this. i got a cell phone in here. Um, if a market goes down – let's say we got 2008. Market goes down 50%, okay? And your fund manager followed it down, but he worked pretty hard. And he only went down 40%, okay? And you go to retire, and you have to cash that money in. So now you've got 40, you lost 40% of your retirement in 2008. Well, that 40% doesn't do you any good. Now, say you shorted like a good little trader did, and you made, let's say, 10%. That's probably about what we did, 10 12%. We didn't set the world on fire. Okay, so the absolute the relative performance isn't bad, but the relative performance, yeah, you might be able to live off that. That ten percent is better than a puppy eye. Okay, better than losing forty percent of the money. So you can't live off relative performance. You can't live off losing money. If you lose money, you can't take that. Hey, look, I I got this. Uh, you know, I want to go to the grocery store. Look, I only lost forty percent of my money. So can I have some groceries with that? Okay, no, you can't do that. But if you made ten percent. You could take a piece of that 10% and actually go to the grocery store. And it's amazing how how big uh, – I'm reading Greg Morris's book, uh, Invest with the Trend, which is a good book, by the way. And, um, uh, you know, truth be told, I am friends with Greg. We had dinner a couple nights ago. Uh, he's an awesome guy, very smart, and he's running a bunch of billions and billions of dollars. Um, but in his book, he talks a lot about the fact that you can't live off of that – relative performance, and that's probably what's got it in my head right now um, and why it's so important. So to give him credit, so uh, read his book if you get a chance. It's on my website uh, down to the right, okay? Now, the question does become, if it's the only game in town, do you play the set? Do you play it? Okay, right now, the only thing trending is energies, utilities, foods. Do you play it? And the answer is yes, if you really, really like the setups, okay? What's his name, Greg Morris? Yeah, it's Greg Morris. Um, it's Invest with the Trend. It's a very, it's pretty much, it's a, kind of encyclopedic, uh, but he spends, whereas I just spent a few um, pages talking about some myths of Wall Street, for those of you who are more cerebral or your engineering types and want a little bit more proof, uh, he actually, the book's right here, Invest with the Trend, and uh, use that link, I'll make a buck, I think, a dollar or something, I'll throw it in a plate, um, if it's just a little bit, I'll throw it in a plate, um, which it will be. <laughs> Uh, it's a good book, though, and, and he's the first half, like I said, if you're more engineering-oriented or cerebral type, 
he really defines a lot of things about relative performance and the importance the importance of absolute performance and he also goes into a lot of things like not like they like the buy and hope people will tell you well if you miss the 10 best days in the market uh, you're gonna your performance will go down well he'll show you a bunch of statistics on what if you miss the 10 worst days of the market through proper technical analysis and things like that so it's a it's a really good read, especially if you're more cerebral. I mean, I've been around long enough to know what he's saying um, without having to see the proof. But for somebody who, who likes to, the proof, and I'm only halfway through, so he's basically ripping everybody a new one right now, and he's ripping modern portfolio theory a new one um, in the first half of his book. Uh, and it's, been, it's entertaining and very good, so I, I suggest you do read it, um, even though I am personally friends with him. So, so what do we do? Again, not to beat to that horse. If you like a setup, take it. Just make sure, as usual, you wait for entries, and you might want to use a somewhat liberal entry. And liberal entries, a lot of times, will keep you out of new trouble. By liberal entry, if you have a stock that's trading and pulls back a little bit, don't get in right here. Give it a little bit of wiggle room, just in case a stock rallies up on noise alone and then begins to die. And that in and of itself will keep you out of a losing trade. And that's the other thing, too, when looking at those trades, uh, somewhat liberal entry, even on the crappier chart patterns, the chart patterns that I wasn't very impressed with, would have kept you out of trouble, too. And then, of course, when you do get triggered in, honor your stops just in case, okay? Now, when you're making the transition, let's say the market does go through some sort of transitional phase, like we could be in right now. You want to take things on a setup by setup basis. Lately, the database has been producing mostly shorts and very few longs. Okay, and I'm going to show you that ebb and flow in the portfolio here in a few minutes, and hopefully that'll help things make more sense. But you want to take things on a setup by setup basis. If you're seeing a lot of shorts setting up, then that's the database telling you you might want to take a look at the at the short side. Uh, conversely, on the long side, if you see a lot of long setting up, then maybe that's a database saying you might want to take a look at the long side. Okay. Now, if you are seeing some shorts that are setting up, instead of looking at these stocks, I'm getting a few questions, fielding a few questions, stocks that look like this that have pulled back. If you're in a longer-term bear market, then by all means, stocks that are pulling back are for lows like that in longer-term established obvious trends are the way to go. Okay. But when the market's beginning to roll over like it could be, you're better off focusing on those stocks that are coming off of all-time highs that are just beginning to set up. And one thing is that they're priced for perfection. I did a webinar a while back, and I spent a lot of time talking about price for perfection. I'm getting a few questions on that. I don't want to spend an, an entire webinar on that again, but just to kind of um, summarize it, price for perfection means that a stock is trading at high levels, Let's say it's up, and I'll just throw a number out there. It doesn't have to be an exact number, but let's say it's up 400% or 1,000% over the last several years, uh, depending on the volatility of the stock. If it's not that volatile stock, 3 or 400% is a lot over the past several years, or 1,000% if it's a little bit more volatile stock. And the market started to look a little iffy. Well, those stocks, the bigger they are, the harder they're going to fall when they do roll over or if the market does roll over. And it, it, it kind of dovetails into that relative strength problem, okay? And we do look to play those shorts as they begin to roll over, especially a stock that could be priced for perfection, meaning that uh, if it's a it's at high levels, everybody, their brother, has now heard of this stock because it's going up a 1,000%. Uh, it might have matured as a company in that process, read the GoGo Nomo article on my website. That GoGo momentum begins to wane. Okay, so those are the stocks that are again not to beat the dead horse. Price for perfection, meaning that they're going to have to do everything right to keep on keeping on. They're under a microscope now. Their earnings are going to have to be great. Not only great, they're going to have to knock the cover off the ball on their earnings because the earnings forecast are going to be meaningless. They're going to have to beat the earnings forecast by a factor of two. If they just meet expectations, then that could be the end of these stocks. 
So that's what I mean by price for perfection. And those stocks that are just beginning to set up, you're going to have the most amount of people on the wrong side of the market. So if you've got a long, long-term trend, and then you get a bow tie or a first thrust or whatever pattern begins to set up, as the stock begins to sell off, everybody here becomes a loser. The further it goes down, the more losers this stock creates, okay? And again, read the, read the article Gogodomo because I talk a lot about how overhead resistance or overhead supply is made. And I think that's, that's vital to this um, conversation, okay? And you're going to have the most amount of people on the wrong side of the market, and that exacerbates itself as the stock begins to slide. So it's kind of like the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And then the other thing, too, which often gives you your initial push is the Johnny Come Lately's. You have a stock that rallies up, and then it begins to roll over. Well, the Johnny Come Lately's are going to be buying right about here, right at the absolute worst time. And as soon as that stock begins to roll over, they're going to be the first ones to dump. And that first little push lower might encourage people that bought back here that are now facing the loss to sell. And then where it exacerbates is as this drops, more and more people further and further back are going to be pressured to sell the stock. Okay? Does it mean that the company's not still great and going great places and doing great things and curing cancer and making good burritos or making awesome exercise clothes for guys like me who eat too many burritos? Okay? It just means that maybe the company has matured, maybe it's going to roll over and be priced for perfection and under a microscope, and the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And more importantly, without thinking too much, okay, we're, we're kind of on the cusp of thinking too much here, but without thinking too much, think about those who own the stock prior to you shorting it and what they might be inclined to do when they decide uh, that, that they, when they realize, I should say, that they're losing money on the stock, okay? And again, wait for those entries, keep them kind of liberal. And also, give them a lot of room on the stops. I'm just going to kind of touch on shorts here in a few minutes. But if you do start shorting, make sure you give your shorts plenty of room because the retrace rallies, to put it mildly, suck. Okay? Now, let's talk about the ebb and flow, okay? And the easiest way to do this is to talk about what has happened lately in the trading service. And by the way, you know, I, I think I pimp things, but maybe I don't pimp them enough. It's like somebody quit the newsletter. I'm like, why'd you quit the newsletter? Well, you don't, you don't ever, I, I left because I, I want more specific advice. It's like, oh, okay, well, you know, I have a trading service where I give, I give more specific advice. It's like, oh, you know, it's like, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yoda. <laughs> anyway, straight out of my trading service, okay, uh, out of the official recommendations, six out of six of the last trades were win winning trades. Five were profitable longs, and they stopped out, and then one was a profitable short that stopped out, meaning that trailing stop got hit. Now, as far as the new portfolio, hopefully it's a new improved, but that remains to be seen, okay? And that's where the ebb and flow comes in. We saw a couple of shorts setting up, and guess what? Knock on wood, so far, and let me look over my quote screen, yeah, so far, both are still profitable, and then we got one new long, and let me look over to my quote screen, and yeah, it's still stinking up the joint, okay? So we ended up with two pluses and one minus, and then we had one previously profitable long is now a loser. Actually, as of this moment, it's now flat, okay? So it lost a little bit, but now it's flat. It's right on the cusp of going back into profitable. And then we have one profitable long, and that's a gold stock that has given up some of its open profit. It may stop out. I don't know. Okay, I hope it does it, but if it does, it does. And then the only thing that I want to point out here, I mean, because this is, I'm very proud of this up here. Six out of six. You know, I was doing a video a while back, a long time ago, like 10 years ago, maybe even 15, and um, I was saying how the performance. Sometimes it's really good, sometimes it's not so good, but Sometimes you might go weeks or even months where you're 100% correct, and, and they immediately stopped the video and said, uh, Dave, you can't say that. And I'm like, it's true. But they edited it out, so I couldn't say that. But there's your, there's your 100%, okay? Now, I'm proud of it. Don't get me wrong. But I'd be more proud of it if there were a couple of big winners in that, and none of them were really that big, 
And as I preach, you need a few of these big winners to really help you out. So let's take a look at that portfolio ebb and flow real quick and what happens during a market transition. Now here are the six positions down here. One, two, three, four, five, six that stopped out at gains, okay, or overall at least at gains. And you can see that on the second part, the trend following part, we really didn't make a whole lot of money. This is not where the money is, but it's better than a poke of the eye, okay? I'll take six profitable trades any day of the week. The real money is, now this requires a little discretion to stay with it, but the real money is when you catch a big winner and you ride it out like that. Now, look at the current portfolio. This is the one. This is now, eh, as I'm looking at the screens, it's now a scratch, but I don't want to follow the um, moving target on that too much. Let's just say it turned into a loss so far. And here's our due long, which turned into a loss so far. We're just stinking up the joint. The good news is, though, we did get a couple of longs, and this one might be on the cusp of not making much, but I'm sorry, a couple of shorts. So here's two new shorts, and so far they're working out. They're not setting the world on fire, but they're working out, okay, and maybe they'll hit that initial profit target, okay, and work out. And then the other thing is on this uh, other long in here, we're giving up some of the open profits. So it, uh, it stinks, but you have to be willing to give up some open profits, and you have to be willing to, I hate to say be like water, but for lack of a better analogy, you have to give what, take what the database is giving, and you can't go crazy on one side or the other, but just let that ebb and flow tell you what to do. And as I often say, the pressure's off. Don't put a lot of pressure on yourself to say, well, let me figure this market out. I think we're going to go down. I think we're going to go down hard. I think we're going to go down 30% by the end of summer. And we might, okay? But then again, we might not. s and is a percent and a half away from all-time highs. It's even closer today than that. It's probably percent a third away from all-time highs. If that market breaks out to new highs, can the tail wag the dog or the dog wag the tail, whatever the case may be, however you want to look at it, can those 500 stocks, or more, more uh, correctly, can those uh, 100 or 50 stocks or whatever is propping up that index, is that going to be enough to change the sentiment of the whole market to have people want to just start buying with two fists? And the answer to that question, I don't know. But right now, it sure doesn't look like that's going to happen. There's a lot of stocks out there that are downtrends still, even with the S&P trying to go back to new highs. And we'll flesh that out in just a few minutes. So let's assume that the market does roll over. Well, the question, I guess, is will the transition be a smooth one? So if it does roll over, will the long stop out at minus gains or small losses in the portfolio? Okay, that's one thing that you kind of need to ask yourself, okay? But you don't know. And the reason I put make it phrase it as a question is you don't know, but what you're hoping is that will happen, and then you're hoping that the shorts – both new and existing will begin to pick up the slack. So what will happen is these positions will start going down in value, maybe stop out, and these positions on the short side will start going up in value and you start getting more shorts. And that's how you make that transition without any serious market timing. You're looking at the market. You're trying to understand the market. You're trying to see if you get any signals in the overall market. But without getting any serious market timing, just by listening to the database, you'll start putting on shorts. Now, assuming the market goes straight back up. So the question becomes, will the shorts stop out at modest losses or even small gains? And will the longs, new and existing, pick up the slack? Sometimes your longs will actually go down, and that becomes the relative strength problem we talked about earlier, let's say we do find an energy over the next few days, okay, or next week, I should say, because this week's pretty much done. Um, will it go down if the market goes straight back up? It comes back to the relative strength problem. I don't know, okay? The point I'm trying to make here is you don't always know what's going to happen, but you don't have to know what's going to happen to know what to do, okay? Now, what if the market gets choppy? Well, the question becomes, will the transition from long short to mostly flat be relatively painless. I don't know. Maybe you'll get stopped out of all these positions at modest gains. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll have a few losses, okay? And then the next question is, should we enter into that, God forbid, choppy sideways market? 
will something worthwhile emerge? And you don't know, but if you take things day by day, maybe it will. Maybe some commodities will wake up, okay? Maybe some rare earth stocks will start trending again, which they've just been stinking up the joint for quite a while, but maybe they'll catch on again. Maybe some new technology will emerge, some new battery technology or something exciting. Okay, maybe some commodity-related issues, like aforementioned uranium, will take off. Or maybe some IPOs will come in and do really well in spite of a sideways market. I doubt that any good IPOs will come to the market if the market begins to tank, because nobody in the right mind will bring new IPOs public. And that's something we talked a lot about in the stock selection webinar, not to pimp that again, but we did. Because the great thing about trading IPOs is they could be self-policing. And I've been thinking about doing a service on IPOs, but the problem is I'm worried about the timing of the launching of the thing. And, and I, at the end of the year, when I started thinking about this, especially when I was doing a lot of research that really was promising, I was thinking I'd be crazy not to do this, especially because it would force me to work even harder and focus even harder on the IPOs. But what I was concerned about is where we had a bubble, and I think the answer to that question is yes. And uh, my wife asked me, we were out for a walk a couple days ago, she goes, do you ever do anything with that IPO service? And I said, uh, I said no. I said, um, I said, like I said, I was concerned that we were in the bubble, and it looks like we, sh we were. And she said, boy, you nailed that one. And I'm like, yeah, I did. So, okay. Um, Margin call. Okay, so again, you don't really have to, the pressure's off, you don't really have to figure out what's going to happen. So the question is, is the transition going to be a smooth one? And the answer is, I don't know, okay? And no one does. Now, this doesn't mean that I don't think about it. This doesn't mean that I don't worry about it. This doesn't mean that I don't care about it. But what I try to do best I can, and I've gotten better at it over the years, Okay, it, it gets easy -er over the years. It does not get easy. It never gets easy. When you feel like God, which I do once or twice a year, I'm, I'm DiCaprio on the front of that Titanic. Okay, when I start feeling like that, when I'm printing money, when I'm running 100% correct for two or three months standing, then I know that I'm getting ready to get whacked. So whenever I have that feeling, it's like right at that point, you're never really allowed to feel great for long in this business. And that's something that you kind of got to wrap your head around. And it does get easy, -er, but it never gets easy. So, again, setup by setup basis. Once you really like a setup, make sure you wait for an entry. You might be wrong, so use a stop. Okay, this is the only thing I can guarantee you, so you might be wrong. And then, again, let that ebb and flow do its magic. Okay. Another thing that you need to realize is it's okay to get flat. It, this is another one of those pressures off type of speeches. A lot of people, I mean, this is where the dead money comes from, okay? We get into a stock, it rallies up nicely, and then it starts consolidating. Consolidates for two weeks, maybe two months, maybe three months. Dave, it's dead money. It's dead money. It's dead money. And then it takes off again. Okay. Well, it might eventually become dead money. And that's money that never makes any more money. But then it might take off again, too. And a lot of people are so obsessed over they have to have something working all the time. Okay. You don't always have to have something working all the time. I mean, it's sort of like you don't want to, it's almost like if, if conditions aren't good and you're putting on positions, okay, you're making bets. And you're making bets for for either action or, or you're just flat out gambling. I'm trying to think of why you would do that. Uh, but but take the – don't have that pressure on you. It's okay to sit on some cash. And it's cliche, but a return of capital is sometimes more important than a return on the capital. And this is where a lot of people put a lot of pressure. And, you know, I've got a lot of pressure on me, too, because I'm doing this publicly. If I was just privately um, bumping along, nobody's looking over my shoulder too much, um, then maybe I could say, well, I really don't like anything. I better not do anything. But 
knowing that somebody's expecting me to find the best opportunity, I got a little pressure on me to do that. But you know what? It's like if I'm not going to personally do something, then there's nothing to do. And as I've said quite a bit in the past, it's like when, when years ago when my trading service was through trading markets, I could recommend a bunch of stinkers and uh, the, the subscriber base would actually increase. But if, if things got choppy and I backed off on my setups, uh, subscriber base would go down. I actually would have salesmen call me and say, Dave, could you start recommending more setups? And I'm like, no, there's nothing to do, so let's not do anything. So sometimes it's hard to take the high road, especially if you're un under some sort of pressure. Okay, And if you are under pressure to perform on a personal basis, then you might want to do something to kind of take the pressure off, as a client of mine used to say, you need to sing like you don't need the money. Okay, So a busy, 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 busy doctor or lawyer or automatic transmission mechanic that's making good money okay, doesn't need to trade to make money so they can take the trades that are the most lucrative, and then if things aren't worthwhile, they could just keep fixing those transmissions and keep repairing those patients or fixing those patients, whatever you do to patients, and keep making money, okay? Defended bad guys or good guys, depending on how you look at it, okay? So the pressure's off. Again, go with the flow, and then one day at a time. Okay, let me field some questions here because we've got a lot of questions that are stacking up. Uh, we'll get to individual stocks in a minute. Just hold off on those for another few minutes, and then we'll get to those. Okay, Fred says, should biotech technology and other momentum sectors remain weak? Does it make sense to chase after more defensive names and alongside food utilities, et cetera, since they lack the volatility and potential for great expansion? Okay, since they lack the volatility and potential for great expansion of range, rapid price per share advancement, et cetera. Yeah, Fred wrote that before we before I started the whole speech. Um, and, and the question is, and that's one reason why it's okay, it's like right now the the REITs are setting up, okay? And just because something is low in volatility doesn't mean that something bad can't happen. And the REITs are kind of plodding along like this and now they're making new highs. Is it worth trading these REITs? I don't know. I'm going to take it on a setup by setup basis. Uh, Energy is overall pretty low in volatility, but there are some individual issues that might work out nice. In the foods, I tried to be cute. Okay, the foods are like the most boring stocks in boring town, but they're heading higher. So I tried to be cute, and I traded a very high volatile food stock. And so far, I've gotten my butt handed to me. So it's kind of darned if you do and darned if you don't. And I think that's probably the best way to sum it all up, Fred, is that with this relative strength game, it's darned if you do and darned if you don't. If you don't go after these high relative strength stocks, that's the only game in town, and they keep plodding along, going higher and higher. If you do go after them, the market takes off, and then those stocks become a source of funds, or the market crashes, and those stocks fall with the overall market, like I just said. So the answer is, on a setup-by-setup -setup basis, maybe, okay? And I am looking for setups every day. I've been looking through the energies, trying to find something, because that's probably going to be the best out of all of them. I don't imagine I'll find much in utilities, although there might be some utility that's um, maybe more alternate energy. But then again, it's kind of like, well, that still doesn't solve your problem because you're going up to higher volatility because what if you end up in, in this little food stock that we ended up in that's just not working out, okay? Okay, Fred says that makes sense, so I can stop talking about that. Good. For those of us who want to follow your methodology but don't have time to review thousands of stocks daily, is there some way to abbreviate the process? At least during the work week, and still find opportunities. Uh, yes. Go to DaveLandry.com. And let's see. Where's that? Oh, over here. And if you don't have time to look at thousands of stocks, but you would like to, click right here, trading service. There you go. And even better, if you want to stay with me a long time, click on the stock selection webinar, and you get a free year of the trading service by doing that. Okay. James, you're going to, I swear, this is, uh, James is not a show. <laughs> 
We are approaching vacation season. How do you handle your positions if you're going on vacation away from the market for a few days or a few weeks? Well, nowadays it's really not a problem for the most part because you have smartphones and laptops and everything else. I've never gone anywhere without my laptop. I might be going overseas soon. Uh, knock on wood, I hope things work out. And guess what? I'll have a laptop <laughs> with me. And um, I think my wife says, you never go anywhere without your laptop, and I don't. Um, so, but yeah, if you're going to go, if you're going to be, if you're going to go hike the mountains, I mean, once in my career, I, I did take a break off, and, 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 and I actually went uh, canoeing in the Boundary Waters, and then before that, I used to race sailboats, but I, I find myself doing less and less of those type of activities where I'm away. Uh, I, I haven't missed a day, and I can't remember the last time I missed a day. Uh, of, of not following the markets. But anyway, I digress. Um, you could use a liberal, very liberal, what I call an airbag stop, and then I think I borrowed that term. There was a book years ago. I don't remember whether it was a good book or a bad book. It doesn't stand out, but it was. I think it came from Trading Chaos. Uh, some people, I know that, and, and I say that, and that's just my opinion. Obviously, I'm not allowed to give the opinions of others. But um, some people really liked it. Uh, I, I didn't. I don't remember it being uh, anything that I could use as a trend follower, um, because chaos is what I'm. I'm looking for order and not chaos. But anyway, I think he used. Um, I want to say his name is Bill Williams, but I think he used the term first. So I'll give him credit. An airbag stop. It's a stop that's gonna be. It's quite a ways away from the market, but at least you're not gonna be wiped out if it's hit. So maybe put in some airbag stops. Um, as I wrote early on, I, I made back when I was in my sailboat racing days and things. One of the one of my biggest weeks or months or whatever was when I was away from the screen and my positions went up tremendously. And then when I got back, of course, I sold everything and then I watched watching ang anguish as they went up three or four hundred more percent. These were option positions, so they could go up tremendously. So um, sometimes being away from the market is not always a curse, is what I'm trying to say. So maybe use some airbag stops on that, okay? Okay. Joe says, over the last several weeks, I've noticed more and more low volatility, big, thick blue chips have, in the sentence ends, I'm guessing, gone higher. And the answer is, yeah, you've, you're on to something. Um, what's his name? Gary Anderson, I think. Um, he has a book called Janice Factor. I haven't read it yet, but he was at that meeting that I was at a couple of weeks ago. And he is actually quantified when you have the um, the go go stocks beginning to break down. You got your in, in low volatility beginning to, uh, to take off. Okay, and that's where you get these. And he has like these scattergrams that are pretty cool. And you get in you need quadrants and everything. And I don't want them. Um, what's the word I'm trying to look for? take away from what he's saying because he said it so eloquently it's like I really need to study it but see he's actually quantified it where you get shifts from one quadrant to another where these momentum stocks end up over here and then all of a sudden over here you end up with a bunch of low volatility uh, stocks okay and that's where we are right now and he's actually quantified that and it's fascinating and I'm looking forward to reading this book I've got so much reading to do after going to that meeting that uh, it's going to take me a while to get to it. But the name of the book is Janice Factor. I have not read the book, but I have to tell you his presentation was fascinating. Okay, And what he is, a con and the reason I liked it so much is he's quantified it, and you know me, I'm still Mr. Empirical. Okay, um, He could plot a little scattergram that's telling him what you just said, Joe, but I know it because I looked at 239 sectors and a couple thousand stocks. Now, he thinks I'm, I'm doing too much work, uh, but I think, well, I'm, I'm impressed that you quantified it, and it's a beautiful thing you've done. I can't wait to learn more about it, but I'm still going to look at those stocks because that's the way I roll. That's how I like to do my analysis. I'm not really smart enough to try to quantify all that stuff. I did it years ago, and um, I decided that you're much better off just looking at a lot of charts and everything. But I don't want to take any way, thing away from what he's done because it's fascinating, and I think I'm, I'm very much looking forward to studying his work. And I would suggest you do too. If you want to get a jump on me, <laughs> feel free to jump ahead and then let me know what you think, okay? 
Dave, over the last several weeks, I have noticed looking in the database more and more. Yeah, we just talked about that. Uh, well, here we go. A breaking out of multi-year basis. More and more volatility, big, uh, low volatility, big caps. Uh, okay, Joe, when we get to the charts, give me an example of that, and we'll pull it up, okay? Eric says, your work is better because things change, and you will see where uh, it, it, it and you'll see it where equations may not. Yeah, and, and that's a case where, and, and, um, and God, the stuff, this, uh, gosh, the stuff was very ex exciting, and I can't wait to to, to read it. It, it. it seemed fascinating, but one has to wonder. Like right now, we're seeing these. I mean, he, I'm sure he's seeing something in his scatter plots, and uh, we talked about it briefly at the meeting. But right now, I'm sure he's seeing these low volatile stocks begin to rally, these foods, etc. But what if it's the end of the trend there and not the beginning, okay? And then it ends up being just a bit of an aberration. So that's the only problem when you quantify things too far, and that's why I still like to look at things to say, okay, well, we got these foods, we got these energies, we got these utilities, and to a lesser extent, the REITs setting up. Um, what are we going to do? Well, let's think about whether or not we want to take these setups. Okay, let's take a setup or two. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Whereas if you get a signal, some sort of mechanical type of signal, and I'm not saying that 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 he does because I'm not. I like again, I haven't read the book. Uh, but that that's almost like flipping a switch. Say, okay, bam, we're going to move our money into this quadrant, and and that's how we're, we're going to stay in this quadrant until things change. Where that to me seems like it could be a little bit more drastic, although it might work tremendously well over the long time. Again, I have it long term. I haven't read the book, okay? Be like water. <laughs> Those, uh, what's his name? Quan, I can never remember his name. Quan Kane Chang? Quan Kane Chang? Who's a kung fu guy? It says, be like water. Those, uh, they running those old kung fu episodes. <laughs> Quan Chang Kang? What's his name? I wrote about him in layman's. Never was really a fan of the show, so I would have I probably would have watched it if Bruce Lee would have gotten a role like he was supposed to. Okay, okay, uh, let's just finish up real quick, and then we'll hop into the charts. Uh, I'm not going to bore you and go through this too much. I just want to point out that in an ideal world, charts would just do like this, and you trail, you stop lower, and you make a lot of money. Unfortunately, it's just the, you have to deal with these sharp retrace rallies. It's the nature of the beast. So you're going to have to have stops as wide as you can stand it. And obviously, you want to base it on the volatility of the underlying stock. And the good news is shorts do slide faster than they glide. The bad news is sometimes that can be hard to get on board. And then again, it can be darned if you do and darned if you don't. It's like they all go at once. A couple of weeks ago, if you would take my Landry list, and this would be this would be one we could probably frame. I should probably frame it <laughs> because I had a dozen shorts on it, and 11 out of 12 of them imploded. It was the most beautiful thing ever. But you can't rush out and take 11 positions in one day. You kind of got to pick and choose between you pick the best of the best and do what you can because you don't know if that market's going to follow through or not. You can't take 11 positions. Whereas on the long side, it's a little bit different. I talked about this last week just without getting too too much further into it, and we'll have plenty of enough time to get to the charts, which we'll do in one second. But like I said, on the long side, it's like you might have those 11 setups. And even if you like, let's say you liked all 11 of them, which, yeah, it's probably, that's usually not the case. Usually we just have a couple you liked anyway. Uh, but let's just, say, let's just say you liked a couple of them. And, you, you watch it for a couple of days, and maybe one triggers, and then the other one doesn't. And then a few days later, then you look at back at that same list, and it's like, you know what? I like this other one here, too, now that it's pulled back a little bit more. And then maybe that one may or may not trigger. It's like you have time to watch it unfold, and maybe tomorrow, the next day, or even a week from now, some of those stocks you're looking at will set up. It's like you have you can't sit, you never sit back and relax in this business, but you have a little bit more time. On the short side, it's like, bam, they all go at once. It's like, damn, I missed it, you know? So that's um, one of the problems with the short side. Uh, and the one thing, I'm not going to go through all these again, but it does force you to see both sides of the market, and that's the beauty of the short side. So uh, let me just wrap up the slide so we can hop into the charts. Um, again, one day at a time. 
as usual. Okay, beat the dead horse on that. And let the market come to you. Um, as a, uh, The market's not going out of business. That was at Eddie Z's book. Eddie Z uh, recently interviewed me. The book's on my website somewhere, so you can check that out. I think it's 99 cents on Kindle, or maybe um, it might have gone up a few bucks. But it was 99 cents for a while on Kindle, so I think it's worth it. Uh, and, again, I can't beat the dead horse enough on this. Play a good offense in 2014, and that's my goal this year. And I know it should have been my goal every year, and it was. But this year, I'm really making that conscious effort conscious effort to pick the best and leave the rest, okay? So if you can't stand it, then you want to take – you really want to go ahead and take that trade. But if it's mediocre at best, then don't do something for the sake of doing it, okay? Again, the pressure's off, okay? We don't have to flip this switch from a bull to a bear. But if you see some shorts setting up, that some stocks begin to roll over, they look pretty good, then take them if you really like them, okay? And on the flip side, if you see some of these foods or energies or whatever looking pretty good, pull it back and then take them, okay? Just practice proper money management and let that ebb and flow uh, work for you. Uh, announcements, uh, like I said earlier, we're, uh, this is going to one year of the trading service, okay, for those um, – you who um, who get the stock selection webinar, and then again, I, 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 get, I get asked quite often, "Hey Dave, do you have a service?" Yes, I do. <laughs> so go to my website for more of that. First two books, by the way, are still relevant. If you're here today and you want them both, just buy ten best and say, "Dave, give me uh, hook me up, and I'll give you the um, I'll give you the first one." Okay. And then obviously there's some other books that I recommend. All right, let's hop into the. Uh, Let's hop into the overall market, and then you guys want to start talking about individual stocks, feel free to do so. Um, and what I want to do is I want to work my way out uh, from the micro to the macro, and then I want to uh, drill down to some sectors in here. Uh, you know what? Let me, let me do this. Let me get a fresh update. And... Um, let me answer a question or two while it's occurring. Hopefully, the bandwidth will, will be allowing. Okay, the question is, we're trying to short actual stocks. Shorting is quite difficult because the inventory problems at the broker. So puts are an option to use. Excuse the pun. Um, they can be. Uh, read read the option chapter. In fact, uh, since, you're, since you're taking time out of your, your busy schedule to be here today, just email me and say, Dave, send me the option chapter. Read the option chapter from my first book, Dave Landry on Swing Trading. Don't expect to be blown away by it. Uh, in a nutshell, just to save you the time of reading it, pretty much you said look at in-the-money options that have um, taken some of the fluff off because if you go in the money, you're not going to have as much of the fluff or I call it fluff, but it's called extrinsic value. Your intrinsics are going to be big enough to where your extrinsic values are going to be small. And if you are going to, that's okay to, to get established. The only problem is if you get into something that ends up in a longer-term downtrend, it's going to be hard to ride out with options because of decay and other issues. So, yeah, take a look at them, but uh, tread lightly until you know what you're doing uh, with options. And then, uh, obviously, read the chapter. But, yeah, sometimes you could use, I always, on the short side, I always do uh, take a look at the options just in case. The problem with options is it opens up a can of worms. Uh, if I tell you, what I think you should do, and you understand options, you're going to tell me that I'm wrong because you're going to have your own way of doing them. And if you don't understand options, you're not going to understand what I'm saying. So it's like that's why I try to tread lightly and avoid the conversations at all costs, and I've kept it very simple in, um, in what I personally do and what I talk about doing in the books. Okay, let's just um, let this... Um, it's taking a little bit longer than I thought. It should be done. Just a second here. It'll go a little faster. If I get a fresh update, it'll go a little faster when I go through the charts, and that's what I want to do. All right, there we go. All right, let's get back to the overall market. And let's take a look at the micro and work our way out to the macro. All right, let's take a look at the P's first. Now, the P's have been quite impressive in here. They broke down out of the bottom of their trading range, and it looked a little ominous, okay? But what have they done? 
they have come all the way back up to the middle of their range. In fact, like I said earlier, if you measure it, you will see that they are less than a percent and a half, as I said earlier, away from all-time highs. So you really don't want to argue at a market that's that close to all-time highs. Now, back in the chart out a little bit or looking a little further back, it is kind of interesting that they tried to break out and then imploded. Usually, if you take a base or if you're watching a base and the stock or market, whatever, breaks out of the base and then comes all the way back in, usually if you short the bottom of that base as it breaks out, that usually will turn into a, a profitable trade because what happens is the market is faked out. But now it's like the market has faked out and then faked out again. Okay. So when it's getting a little erratic like that, in general, you want to leave it alone. And the other thing to realize is it's going mostly sideways as of late. But the point I'm trying to make or was trying to make earlier is that, you know, like I wrote a column this morning. This is quoting somebody. I don't normally talk like a redneck, but uh, it ain't too bad. You know, if you're just looking at the peas, it ain't too bad. But then when you look a little further, things are not looking so hot. So let's back the chart out a little bit. And you back the chart out a little bit. So far, it just, just looks like a little bit of consolidation. And you can see the longer-term uptrend still remains intact. Just for SGs, because it's well-watched, nothing magical about it, but because it's well-watched, let's throw in a 200-day simple moving average. And you can see that the P's have a ways to go before getting there. But now it's also going to correspond roughly with these prior lows in here. Okay. So, so far, that's held, and you can see the daylight just following the daylight, meaning the lows are greater than the moving average. If you stay long, as long as you have upside daylight, you probably would do pretty well. And if you stayed short when you had a significant amount of downside daylight, significant mean a week or so, you probably would do okay longer term following the market. But keep in mind, it is much harder to predict the overall market than it is to predict individual stocks. Okay. Now, one last thing in the piece. Um, oops. Where were we at the end of last year? Oh, about 1850. Where are we now? Eh, about 1850. Oh, 1860 today, right? So let's at uh, one, two, three, four and a half months. And there's not much forward progress. So make sure you draw your arrows too, okay? So even if you're not worried about the market after looking at all these stocks and all these sectors in the NASDAQ and the Russell and all the other stuff, then at the least, draw your arrows on the S&Ps and see that we haven't gone anywhere in about four months. And that should be somewhat concerning. Now, let's take a look at NASQAQ. A little bit different story. I guess we'll take a look at it further out while we're here. Notice that it did come down to kiss that 200-day moving average, and it bounced off of it, which was also right about the area of its prior lows, circa 4,000 or so-ish, okay? And it's done what it's supposed to do. It's bounced off those lows. But what's concerning is that's a pretty serious down move. And then so far, it only appears to be pulling back. What does Big Dave say to do? When in doubt, take the chart out. Okay. So look at your lines drawing through the bars. And you'll see that you've got a pretty thrust, pretty good thrust down followed by a pullback. Just for S and G's, let's put the bow tie moving averages in. And what do we have? Well, you've got a bow tie down. It's a little sloppy, but you got a bow tie down. Nonetheless, the moving averages have rolled over and crossed over. It took them a while to do it. But you got a bow tie down from multi-year highs. So that's a fairly significant signal. Let's see how many high years is that. Oh, it's at least five-year highs, okay, maybe even longer, okay. All right, uh, let's get through a couple of – the sectors shouldn't take long. Just give me a couple of minutes here. Let's take a look at Rusty first. Rusty, same sort of action as the NASQAQ. Pretty much a downtrend by pullback. I said pretty much. <laughs> My teenage daughter, are you going out today? Pretty much. So yes or no? Pretty much. We're pretty much gone. We're pretty much going to Baton Rouge for the weekend. Pretty much, huh? <laughs> so you're going pretty much. Anyway, so it's pretty much in a downtrend. Uh, one thing that's definitely in a downtrend is drugs. Biotechnology also in a downtrend, just kind of pulling back in here. Internet and a lot of other of these technology-related areas have been in pretty serious downtrends in here. 
Uh, here's the internet right there. It, CBS have been kind of hanging in there, but on a net net basis, okay. And that's the toughest arrow of all to draw, but really easy if you think about it. Just pick a close and then drag that line forward. Or pick today's close and look backwards in time. So you've got about a month and a half without much forward progress here. So it's hard for me to get excited about a sector that's going mostly sideways. And everything I've been saying lately about a lot of these other sectors like manufacturing, durables, non-durables, etc., they all remain below multiple peaks. And one has to wonder if they're ever going to get back past those peaks. Okay, and they're just looking questionable in here. In some cases, it could be double tops or whatever. Um, you don't rush out and sell those, but you certainly want to pay attention to them when a market is having a hard time getting past its old peaks. Let me find retail for you. That would probably be a better example of what I'm saying. Okay, you can see a longer term uptrend, and then it kind of just meandered in here. And it looks kind of questionable because it never did get past these other peaks in here. So you certainly wouldn't want to rush out and buy this market at this juncture. I'm not, I don't know if there's any shorts that are setting up just yet. Well, there's none that I saw that I was interested in. But this does not look like a market you'd want to buy in here. Uh, financials have been in a lot of trouble as of late. So far, just pulling back. Take a look at like the brokers, uh, national and regional brokers. Looks like they're in a lot of trouble. Anything big in uh, financial. I, I can't show you the one we're looking to short. Uh, but it's big and financial and looks like it's in trouble. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and open it up for individual questions on individual stocks. Uh, Don's here. Anyone want to guess what stock he wants to know about? Ford. Okay, well, Ford is a Nicholas Fine stock, and it's all over the place. And we'll ask Nicholas what he thinks about it. No, is what Nicholas says about Ford. Okay, and you can see we got lots of lines and arrows drawn in here. Just it's electrocardiogram. Okay, beep 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 beep. So there's Ford. Don, you're gonna get bored with me saying it every week. <laughs> he loves it. He loves the abuse. <laughs> you know, it's like um, oh, that's another Don. Um, uh, but you know, it's kind of like uh, it's it's like the joke about the bear. You know, the bear taps him on his on taps a, taps the hunter on his shoulder and has his way with him, and that happens a few times. And then finally, he taps him on the shoulder, the hunter on the shoulder, and says, uh, "You're not out here for the hunting, are you?" So um, I guess Don likes to get beat up a little bit. Joe wants to know about big thick slob. Now you've got to be around for a while to know what slob is. Slob is slumber J, For those of you who don't know, um. It's a big, thick stock. I mean, you kind of set it up. It is kind of wide and loose and all over the place. It is an energy, so occasionally it could trend, okay? So let's see what it's doing. Well, it's up here at new highs, but for me to get excited, we really have to accelerate even higher before I wanted to do anything with it. But, yeah, you know, put it on your momentum list. I'm sure it's in one of my momentum lists uh, because I just blindly follow the momentum list. I don't trade the momentum list on a blind basis, but as a thought experiment that's been ongoing for the last four years, four and a half years, well, four years, almost four years, okay? <laughs> that's what that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Um, I have been maintaining a momentum list of stocks, and I'm pretty sure Slob is in there uh, now because we we're seeing this massive uh, sector rotation. And let me see if we can find it. There used to be a way to hit Control M or something to see if it was in the list. <clears throat> nope, it's not in the watch list. Okay, but it's probably it's probably on deck to go into this momentum list here. But you can see you got utilities in here and uh, probably some food companies somewhere in here and stuff like that. Got a couple of placeholders in here. Okay, Yahoo is a short for Mr. Phil. And then there's a few questions stacking up. We'll get to them. Uh, I'm going to say no. And if you go, Phil, you were in the stock selection webinar, so go back in and watch it again. I know if you can't sleep, it's hard to stay awake. But uh, you don't want to short something that gaps against the trend. So this is a trend, and we're looking to short, and then you got this gap against the trend. Now, if you want to fire off a day trade or something, yeah, I see what you're saying. You kind of got that witch hat thing going here. It stalled right at these prior peaks and all. But I just don't like them 
that when a gap against the trend. But yeah, if you wanted to do something, do something on a day trade basis or a couple of days ago, if you did that, that's fine. But no, earnings gap, 50, as you know. Okay. Yeah, uh, Phil likes to play the 50 uh, thing, and I've, I've talked with other people about that. It's, it's a pretty cool little way of doing things. It's, it's, it's not how I trade, but it also, but it does, it is momentum based and it is something cool. He likes it uh, when these stocks pop up to the 50 and then roll back over. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, GME, I think, is uh, one that did it recently. This was one that we were short forever. And we got short right here, and then Phil came into my service on, like, day before this day, and he shorted it right here on a throwback to the 50. I'm not a huge fan of the pattern, but, hey, look, thrust down, retracement, pullback, whatever you want to call it, into resistance, went up to kiss that 50 goodbye. Nothing wrong with that, okay, uh, especially the market. I mean, look at what it did right here. You know, I would never have bought the stock back here, but look at that little throwback to the 50, and then it was off to the races. So, he, you're definitely on to something, and I know some people who also, um, uh, Doug Newberry and Bill McKinley, especially Bill, he pays a lot of attention to that little uh, throwback pattern. So it's something cool to do. I think it's, I can't fault you on that because you seem to do really well with it. Okay, Jonathan wants to know about SQNM. That's going to be sequim something. What's that? Sequim, sequim, sequinim, sequinim? Uh, what? Okay, first of all, what's biotech doing? Okay, could anyone tell me what the trend is here? Let me let's just say what's the trend on this chart? Okay, as a uh oh, I know it's confusing. You need here. Okay, is it in an uptrend? Is it in a downtrend? Or is it in a sideways trend? Let's take a look at biotech one more time. Okay, let's try it again. Okay, the answer is downtrend. Okay, so you don't want to rush out and buy anything biotech at this juncture unless you really, 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 really like it. Well, this thing is going sideways for months. Uh, this is, uh, we might have to whip out Nicholas. No, okay, and it's electrocardiogram. And then you got this big gap down here. So that big gap, you could have a lot of bad memories in that big gap, okay, and furthermore, if it does begin to break out, you can have a lot of people that are going to want to get out that may be bought in this range. Maybe they bottom fished in this range. They might be wanting to get out. So remember, or never forget, I should say, that technical analysis is reading the mind of the market, reading the mind of the participants, okay? What happened? How would you feel if you got whacked on this big gap? You want your money back, right? Okay, well, at least the average person is going to want their money back. Okay, you got to think about that that dumb mind out there, the lowest common denominator, and read the charts and see if you could figure out what's their next move or what's their likely their next move. Okay, try overlaying DAX's comparison simple NASDAQ charts. They have much worse roller coaster. F DAC. Let's see. I've never used that one. I've used. Um, on this FDAC, and you want to overlay that on NASDAQ. This is something that that's, works a little bit better in like Metastock. Uh, let's try doing this FDAC X, and then let's make it cyan and close and close. Okay. Now, who is that? Does that Phil? Okay, Phil says he wants me to overlay the the DAX over the NASDAQ. Okay, and what is your observation there, Phil? They have much worse roller coaster than FDAX. C. Try rolling DAX. Oh, DAX. And as compares to the NASDAQ chart. Okay, DAX. All right, let's change it to DAX. I'm not sure what you're, where we're going with this, so let me get it plotted, and then I'll put the DAX in. Okay. Symbol not found. DAX? There's not a DAX? There used to be a DAX. Nope. I can't find that symbol. There used to be a, um, there's a DAX somewhere in an ETF. I don't have time to go find it. What's your point, Phil? What are we saying? FDAC is DAX. Yeah, okay. Well, that's fine. 
Uh, the DAX was more erratic. Yeah, I'll give you that. Uh, there's definitely a positive correlation. See, that's the problem with saying, well, I'm going to trade foreign markets because U.S. is looking a little iffy. Well, looks like if the DAX goes up, if the quack goes up, the DAX goes up. If the DAX goes down, the quack goes down. So the quack and the DAX, quack and the DAX and a, a butt for a, a messed up duck. I mean, how's it go? <laughs> but yeah, they're pretty much they're pretty much the same, you know. Um, I'm not seeing anything that that says that they're not. You've got a really strong positive correlation uh, between these two, and you can't say, well, one's above the other or one's below the other, because I asked uh, Telechart about that. The scaling has nothing to do with whether one market is stronger than the other. There's no relative strength there. Okay, so you have to see, you have to view them. Uh, as in and of themselves. So you kind of have to like, uh, and I'll do it for you, you'd have to take the, the NASDAQ out and take a look at the DAX, and then you could put the NASDAQ back in and um, take a look at the, the DAX or whatever. Oh, I'm sorry. This one will be put the NASDAQ back in. Okay. All right, let's move on from this. Okay, there's been an extra cycle down in the DAX, okay? Well, I don't see it. Up, down, down. Okay, yeah, I hear you. It had, yeah, one, okay, all right. But I'm not sure that's tradable. So let's say, let's say, okay, to, to continue with your argument, let's say that you, you wanted to buy the DAX, because I saw it just the other day. I said, wow, look at the DAX. It's up here almost making new highs, and the NASDAQ looks like it's in trouble. So say you bought the DAX then, well, what happens? We roll over, they roll over. And that's the problem with this this um, trade foreign foreign stocks. For now, it seems like at least and I'm willing to admit that maybe someday they will decouple, but it seems like over the last 15 years they haven't. Okay, or 20 years since I've been doing this, or 20 something years. I'm getting old. You think we need drama means the Germans really need it? <laughs> uh, VRX for Mr. Mark, Abear or Ebert. I know a lot of Mark A bears. I'm a coon ass, so. But if you're uh, a Hebert, I might not know you. Uh, VRX. Okay, you want to short it? What do you want to do with that, Mark? The problem is you've got a lot of support down here if you wanted to short it. Um, so it doesn't look like, it looks like it's going to find a lot of support down here. So I would probably not short it. The other thing, too, it's a little choppy and wide and loose in its downtrend. But, yeah, I hear you. It looks like it's in trouble. But I would leave it alone. FNSR, Fincer. Oops. Oh, come on. There we go. Nope. I know you can do it, Dave. I'm doing it all blindly. Let's see if we can get the thing to come over here. FNSR. Talk amongst yourselves. There we go. Uh, only if it breaks out to new highs decisively, then would I consider it. It's got some bad memories way back here. Eh, that would kind of weigh on me a little bit. Let me make sure there's no splits or anything in there. Nope. Uh, so that would weigh on me, even though it's a long time ago. You'd be surprised how long bad memories can last in a market. I mean, if it was coming off of major lows and those memories are way up there, I wouldn't worry about it so much. This thing would have to break out decisively and trend before I got excited about it because you're just barely clearing these prior peaks in here. Plus, again, you got the big gap down, so I, I would have to I'd leave that alone. What are you scanning for and finding long scan parameters? Um, Mark, if you have um, TC, I'll send you my exact scans. All I'm looking for is a recent new closing high. I'm sorry, not a new closing high. A, um, let's see if I can get to this thing. Well, let me get to it. All I'm looking for is a recent new high, not today. And that's it. And I got some volume parameters in there. So I'm looking for a a recent new high, not today. It means that it made a recent new high and it's pulled back from that high, or 
a recent new low and it's pulled back from that low. That's all I'm looking for in my scans. Okay. Uh, Mark, if you don't mind, because what's going to happen is this, this, um, um, your question is going to get, your email is going to get buried into a file that's going to go to a server somewhere two hours after this, this um, presentation is done, which I'll never probably look at again. So just shoot me your email and say, uh, Dave, give me the scans, hook me up. Okay. Cores for Martin as a short. That one could be one that's priced for perfection. Okay. Uh, my only problem with this one, you see I got the gap kind of marked in here. I've been looking at this one as a possible short, and I loved it back here. I really, really loved it. But see, sometimes maybe I look for too much perfection. But that was a beautiful first thrust down. It also was almost a bow tie at that juncture, okay? And you got this big old gap back here. So that's the only thing I don't like about it, and I would pass based on that. And the other thing, too, my kunash just slipped out. You heard I said I'd pass. <laughs> the other thing is you got a bunch of uh, su uh, support. So it looks like it could drop, but then it's going to drop right to the support. So I'd leave it alone. BIOF. By the way, I'm not going to like much, so don't think I'm like Mikey and hates everything, okay? Um, this one has an HV of 259. That's a little ridiculous uh, for HV. I mean, this thing was at two bucks a share. Now it's at ten bucks a share. It's like it's just too crazy. Uh, you can have too much of a good thing, okay? Uh, maybe if it breaks out, it keeps on trending. But I would be concerned about just the massive move that it's made over such a short period of time. Plus, it's just stupid in the um, volatility standpoint. E series alone, that might work. That's going to be a an energy company. Yeah, I mean, it's trending. And look, it's right here, Landry 100. See, bam, right there. Um, so, yeah, it's on my list. I'm looking at it, but it's not set up just yet. But I'll tell you what I do like about it. I like the fact that it's still coming off of major, major lows. It's gotten past all this fluff. You know, but, Dave, it looks like an electrocardiogram. Yeah, it does kind of bounce around quite a bit. But look at what it's done lately, okay? It's beginning to trend nicely. So by all means, put that on your momentum list. When it pulls back, I think it might be worth a shot, okay? Yeah, good observation, Phil, in that DAX thing. That was kind of fun to, uh, to look at. I'm not sure what we could do with it, but it's pretty cool. QTWW for Andre. QTWW. Um, if anything, it looks like a possible short. It's a little too volatile to be shorting and a little bit too low levels to be shorting. If it was setting up up here, then I'd say maybe. But you're already down here at these major, major lows on that one. So I think I would leave that one alone. It's, it's um, you know, remember I said earlier, maybe these alternate fuels are something to wake up. It looks something like an alternate fuel or something. But I hear you. I think it's in trouble. Don't get me wrong. I just don't like taking shorts at, at lower levels like this. Plus, it's super volatile. But, uh, yeah, I hear you. It looks like it's in trouble. But it's at such low levels. And I hear you. If it goes down to its old lows, then, yeah, I guess it was worth it. And I just like them. I like taking them at higher levels. Okay. Axis for Mr. Chad. A-X-A-S. Oops, what did I just do? I did something. Let me just hit a bunch of keys and see what happens. A-X-A-S. Okay, the question is, is this price for perfection? Uh, I'm going to say no, okay, because it's been up here at 6 before in 2010. Something priced for perfection is something that's in a long, 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 long uptrend coming off of those um, major, major highs, okay? I don't have an example that comes to mind right away, but probably some of those food stocks or, or, or have been rallying up these major highs, okay? There's a lot of stocks that pull back to 200-day MAs and look look okay on weekly charts. UBNT, any thoughts on looking at your patterns on weekly charts? Yeah, you know, patterns are patterns, okay? You can look at weekly tar charts. The only problem is um, if you're looking to, let's say you're looking to short, okay? This stock is sold off. It's pulled back. This has made my list recently as a possible short. 
Uh, it's kind of cleared this support here. It looks like it's in trouble, okay? But if you take a look at a weekly chart, well, it looks pretty crappy to weekly, weekly too. But sometimes with a transitional pattern on a weekly, it's still going to look pretty good. So I just prefer trading off the daily, especially on the short side. If you wait around for a weekly short signal, because they slide faster than they glide, you're going to miss the big part of the action. But, hey, you could use my stuff on daily charts. You could use it on intraday charts. Um, although I would encourage, encourage you against it, but take a look at like, um, well, let's take a look at the spiders and let's take a look at like a, um, a one hour bow tie or something, okay, and see what happened there. Um, but if you are going to use these patterns intraday, I strongly urge you to only take signals off of major highs and major lows if you do something like a bow tie or something in here. And look, you had a bow tie down back here to have it labeled. You had a bow tie down here, okay? Kind of a rough ride, but you could see off of all-time highs, you had a bow tie down in the hourly, and then you had a pretty big implosion. And then off of multi-month lows, you had a bow tie up on the hourly. And so far, that's panned out okay. It, it would, you would have caught uh, quite a bit of this recent um, bounce, okay? Access, would you say it's priced for, okay, we looked at that one. F tech for done. F T E K. We're gonna to have to wrap it up in just a few minutes. So think about any last request you might have. Um, no, Don. Um, unless you want to short it, and the problem with shorting it, it's already at low levels. Um, it, it has no structure to it. You have the big gap down here. I mean, I hear you. It's broken out shorter term, but now you got a big gap to deal with. So it's just it's just all over the place. There's no structure on that one. Okay. Anyone else? Well, while we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming today. I want to thank you for being here, for taking time out of your busy schedule. I appreciate you uh, showing up, especially uh, right before holiday weekend. Uh, to those of you who celebrate, happy Easter, happy Good Friday, enjoy your weekend. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Let me just give it another minute. Anyone else? Hey, Carol, good to see you. Phil, you're welcome. You're welcome, Don. Sorry I didn't pick on you too much. Sorry if I picked on you too much. All right, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Thanks, everyone. Everybody have a fantastic weekend. We'll talk again next week, if not sooner. Thank you so much.